when you or I are having a difficult day, wouldn't it be nice for someone to say to us, uh, take comfort, I have your back. Well, a number of years ago, when I was a very young priest, I was having lunch in the rectory kitchen one day. It was around noon. The secretary had just stepped out and went to her home for lunch. It was very quiet in the house. My pastor wasn't feeling very well, so he went to his quarters and decided to sleep and rest a bit. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. I got up right away to answer it as to not to disturb father. At the door, there was a woman who appeared to be in her upper 60s in age. She asked to speak either to me or to any other available priest because she had a problem. I invited her, please come in, have a seat, and we sat down in the office area, closed the door, and I said, well, how, how can I help you? What's the matter? Well, she seemed tired, nervous, and had quickly become apparent that she had been drinking. She admitted that she was very angry at her husband because she suspected that he was unfaithful to her. To deal with her anger and hurt, she drove to the church. Now think of it, she was drinking, and that was frightening. And then she wanted to seek some counsel for a priest before she was going to go confront her husband. This was all a scene from a movie, it seems. I did everything I could to stall her until the secretary returned so that I could give an emergency signal to call for help because we had a little emergency signal just in case. It didn't work out so well, so well that day. Well, pretty soon, after just several minutes of talking, she got up and she started to head for the door. I asked her, I said, please don't leave. Let's sit and talk. Let's keep talking. But she insisted. She grabbed her coat and grabbed her purse and she made her way out to the car. I followed her right away. I asked her, I said, please, can you just give me your car keys? I, I, I didn't want you to hurt yourself. And the more I tried the angrier she got. She was hurt and angry and very drunk. And all she desired to do was to have a showdown with that two-timing husband. In a continued effort to try to defuse her, I continued my conversation with her from her open front passenger side window. It was a warmer day, and, and so the window was down. I realized after the conversation went on a bit that there was no other chance to stop what could be a horrible decision on her part. So I said a little prayer, took a deep breath, and I lunged into the car and grabbed the keys from her ignition, which she was just about to start, and pulled it back with the keys in my hand. She was flipping out. She was really angry, furious to say the least. And now she's screaming at me. She's threatening to sue me. And all I wanted was my bologna sandwich and to be left alone for 20 minutes, you know? And all this happened. I stood by the door and I managed to ask several people walking by, please call the police, call 911. Well, eventually the police did show up and they took care of this angry, broken-hearted woman. After they arrived, they did her best to calm her down and they took care of her. I gave them the car keys. And after answering a few questions, I turned around, went back to the rectory to let them do their job to my now warm bologna sandwich and tepid glass of milk sitting on the kitchen table. As I sat in the quiet of that kitchen, all I could think to myself was, dear God, is this what it's like to follow you? It was then that I heard, I would say, a response in my heart. I could really hear the affirmation of Christ. It is what I expect of you. And I had your back the whole time. 
At the time of Isaiah the prophet, who lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus, life in Israel was extraordinarily hard. He is called to prophecy, which was around 740, 742 BC, coincided with the beginnings of the westward expansion of the Assyrian Empire, which threatened Israel and which Isaiah proclaimed to be a warning from God to Israelites who had become very selfish, who thought life was all about them, who cared little for the words of the gospel or words of the Old Testament, words of the Ten Commandments. People had become unfaithful. Isaiah did his best to console his fellow citizens who were thirsty for their faith by reassuring them that God would provide the comfort that they needed as they saw their world start to crumble in fear of the invasion. He did what he could to help to save his nation. And God responded to Isaiah with a consolation that happens about 700 years later by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, during a time of occupation and hurt. The process of Jesus' coming was paved by the ways and the lives of many prophetic holy men and women, including John the Baptist, who modeled his life in absolute submission to God. Facing the challenges of life, I think, takes guts and humility, especially in allowing ourselves not to always be in control. Not having the power to control one's life places us under the total authority of someone else. Sometimes the controlling person can be good and caring, like a mom or dad, no, you don't run with a knife. I remember we were told that. Or a teacher who said, stop, don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. Those are the prophetic people in our lives who challenge us and who deeply care from their hearts, and they don't care if we don't like them at the moment. But other times, there are people that control our lives and they really don't care so much for our good, but they themselves are cold and calculating. By the time Jesus comes on the scene, Jerusalem had all but lost control of itself. And many of the once faithful people became suspicious and legalistic, all out of anger and fear for their lives. Today, the second Sunday of Advent invites, invites us to remember that we do not always have control over our lives. But it does not mean that God doesn't care even though we don't have that control. Actually, it may mean very well the opposite. Isaiah says, comfort. Give comfort to my people. And so in our prayer, let us ask God for the courage needed to simply calm down and freely embrace his authority over our lives. Because only when we can allow God to fully guide our lives will we then be able to sleep better, to work better, and to love more authentically. Allowing God full control in our lives is a fight worth working for.